So I had a whole semester where I had minimized my credit load, was still a full-time student, but had quit all my part-time jobs and thought I'm gonna go totally full-time on College Info Geek. And I did less work on the blog during that semester than I did in any of the other ones, which taught me that constraints are very useful. Hey guys, welcome to Creators Campfire. I'm your host, Bob, and in this episode, I sit down with one of my favorite YouTubers and productivity guru, Thomas Frank. Thomas actually started his content career out with his blog, College Info Geek, which he unsurprisingly started when he was in college. He then went on to turn those blogs into YouTube videos and has since built a YouTube channel with over two and a half million subscribers. In this episode, Thomas talked to me about the birth of College Info Geek, how he turned it into a hugely successful blog with over half a million readers every single month, and how off the back of that, he created one of the best productivity YouTube channels out there. Enjoy. Okay, Thomas, I guess what I want to start with you is, I, I know your journey started with College Info Geek, but what was Thomas before that? So what, what were you going to uni for and what did you think you were going to be when you graduated? Oh, this is, this is a fun question. It's very different from what I do today. I wanted to be the guy who's like in the basement of a giant Fortune 500 company running all the computer networks. And I remember being a kid watching The Matrix. My favorite character wasn't Neo or Morpheus, but it was Tank the guy who's in the chair with like 500 computer monitors, they all have the code raining down on them and he just knows every command to do whatever you need. That seems so cool to me. So I was like, I'm gonna go to school to be that guy in the chair, which is funny because it, it meant I wasn't necessarily gonna be like a programmer or something. I really wanted to like run the computer networks and be a systems admin. And so I actually knew what my major was gonna be before I went into uni, which is very different from a lot of people, at least here in America, most people went to school to sort of like feel things out for a couple of years, then just then uh, declare their major. I went and was like, I want to be MIS, Management Information Systems. I'm going to be the dude running all the computer networks. I'm going to know all the system commands. And uh, yeah, very anti-social kind of job that I was gunning for. And now I make videos on the internet and uh, do podcasts and talk to people all day. I love that transition. Okay. So Thomas, what on earth happened? So you obviously start uni and then along the way, College mm -hmm. Info Geek is, is born. So what's the story there? Like, how did that come about? Yeah, so it's like a whole confluence of factors. I actually mapped out this career journey at one point. Um, I think it was when I made the launch video for 2021 on my channel, which is like, I think it's called like what to do when you feel uninspired or something like that. And it sort of talked about how like creativity is cultivated by doing a lot of different things. And uh, in Steve Jobs parlance, you're like collecting dots, which you connect later on in ways you couldn't foresee. So that is sort of how College Info Geek and this whole career came to be. Uh, the first part of it is I went to school for context right after the 2008 uh, stock market crash. So like I graduated in 2009, I lived through my dad losing his job, everyone I know losing their jobs. And this made me think, oh, the world is now much more competitive. I'm gonna have to go to college and just work my butt off and build the best resume ever to get any kind of job because everyone's getting laid off right now. It's super competitive. You know, lucky for me and everyone else, I graduated 2013. The economy is in much better shape. It wasn't as competitive as I thought it was going to be. But uh, that had me in my local library in Ankeny, Iowa, reading every college prep book I could get my hands on. I read them all, every book they had. And then I come into college and I find this blog called Hack College. And it was basically life hacker but for college students it was run by college students and it was you know dorm hacks but also study hacks and things like that how to get jobs so i read basically every post they put up um i also ended up getting a job as one of those people who gives campus tours and helps people who are coming in as freshmen get all set up for their new year I, they called us cyclone aides because we were the iowa state cyclones i don't really know what the job really is called maybe like orientation assistant but part of that job required going through literally six months of training on everything you would need to know to help a new student coming in so how to use the on-campus system to sign up for classes but also like what do you get to tell a kid if they're worried about being homesick or they're worried about study skills and that kind of thing so we had all this training and uh so you know a couple of dots i was connecting and then near the end of my freshman year, the two founders of Hack College announced that they were graduating college and by their own rule, the blog had to be for students by students so they couldn't write for it anymore and they needed new writers. So they had this whole application, which I applied for, thinking this is gonna be great for my resume and I like to write, so why not try it out? Uh, and I got rejected. Oh. And I'd written this whole post for them. Yeah, like I, was, I thought I was a shoe in but nope, they rejected me. So I'd written this whole guest post 
that was sort of like my application and they weren't going to publish it. They weren't going to hire me. And I'm like, well, I want to do this. What's to stop me from just doing it myself? <laughs> so I had messed around with WordPress before uh, and I kind of already knew how to install it. So I just bought the, the uh, domain collegeinfogeek.com. A pattern in my life has been, I can never think of good names for things. So I just take the first bad name I can think of and I just start rolling because otherwise I will procrastinate forever. <laughs> That's a great tip. <laughs> uh, by the way, Creator Campfire is a great name for a podcast. Thank you so much. See, I'm only good at naming other people's things. When it comes to naming my own things, I'm rubbish at it. So I, I pick that. I just buy the domain, whatever. It's like a million syllables, but at least I now have a blog and I can start writing on my own. And it was it was literally just, I want to share what I'm learning to be a more effective student. And I thought it might be a good resume item, like under the personal project section that would help me get jobs. So I'm doing that like literally just as a side project. I think in the beginning it was one or two articles a month. I was very interested in entrepreneurship and tech and not at all interested in study skills. So very ironically, for the first probably four or five years of its existence, College Info Geek did not have a lick of actual study skills content. It was all like how to uh, get the most out of a career fair or how to get an internship or like the best apps for staying fit in college, like that kind of stuff. It was all like adjacent to the actual studying, which is pretty funny. Uh, and then I just got more and more into it and started realizing like, I don't just love the writing process, but I also love the whole process of building this thing. It's like my baby. It's this really cool project that I get to build from scratch. And I was learning about uh, SEO and website speed and design and all this kind of stuff. And also like starting to make some connections and friends in the blogging world. So I'm doing that on the side. And then uh, the second, sem- I guess the second summer of my my college career, I get the vaunted internship that everyone's supposed to get. Uh, and I was so excited about this because it was the company I wanted to work for. And they were like, hey, we've seen you at the career fair enough times. You've come to all these events that we've put on. Like, we don't even need to interview you. We're just going to hire you. And you can literally pick whatever department you want to li- work in. And I'm still thinking, I want to be the guy who runs all the computer networks. So I go, put me in networking, coach. I want to be a computer networker, which they do. And I promptly learned that at least at that company in that department, the job isn't, you know, walking miles a day, running network cable and designing servers and stuff like that, which that is a job. But what I was doing was sitting in a gray cubicle in a finance company, eight hours a day. And my job, I kid you not, my job was to block websites oh, no. for everyone else. <laughs> That's like they'd be like, all right, we, yeah, every, we got too many people on Facebook. You need to block Facebook for the entire corporate network. But before you do, you have to write up in Microsoft Word a giant document of exactly the steps you're going to take in the firewall. And then it has to be approved by three different bosses. I'm not exaggerating. <laughs> oh it was God. like, it was, it was straight out of office space. There were three different bosses at different levels that it had to go through and get approval from all of them. And then I could do the thing. So you had to like write out exactly what you're going to do wait for the approval, then do it. And I'm like, this is boring. (laughs) But uh, it also taught me, it taught me that you can't really understand the attributes and qualities of work that you enjoy or don't enjoy until you actually do them. When I was younger, I thought I need to find my dream job and it needs to be in whatever the right industry is for me. And I think a lot of people believe that, like I'm destined to be an astronaut or I'm destined to be the guy in the basement running all the computers. But what I've sort of learned since then is I think we're more drawn to certain qualities of work regardless of the industry, as long as you feel like what you're doing is making an impact, you actually care about what you're doing. And then there's like, some more technical qualities. Uh, Do you like to work in isolation? Do you like to work with a team? Do you like to interact with customers or the public at large? Or do you like to be sort of alone in the back doing stuff? Do you like to, and this was a big one for me, do you like to uh, maintain things that have already been built by other people or do you like to creatively build new things? And so in working in that job where my, my position was essentially maintaining the security of the firewall that had already been set up, Uh, I learned that I don't like maintaining things that have already been built. I'm actually a very creative person and I get my fulfillment through building new things and discovering and learning along the way. And as I was hating my time in this internship, I'm also building the blog. And uh, it just so happened that I I had one blog post that went like semi-viral 
and this was like two, that was 2011 viral. <laughs> so we're not talking about like a Mr. Beast video getting 50 million views. We're talking about, I made a, a blog post about how I hung a desk from my loft bed <laughs> so I could have more room under it. Uh, and this was like the most jank woodworking project you ever see, but it, w- it was effective as well. I literally just bought a big piece of MDF board from Home Depot and I bought Tenso chain, which is cheap chain that has a lot of tensile strength. And I just drilled holes in the board and I hung it from my loft bed with the chains. But it was great because, uh, you know, the the desks in my dorm, they were gigantic, but they were also like, they weren't like, you know, this kind of desk. They were the desks that had a bunch of stuff under them. So I couldn't use the storage space underneath. And I'm like, if I just hang MDF board from my loft bed, I can get a ton of storage space beneath this desk, quote unquote. So I did that. I took pictures. I made the blog post. Uh, and back then, blogs like Lifehacker had a habit of essentially retweeting other blogs. They would make like an excerpt post. Like, Thomas Frank makes this cool thing. Here's like the first two paragraphs. Then go check out the rest of it at his blog. So Hat College did that because I had been building relationships with uh, them, even though they rejected me. <laughs> Didn't hold a grudge. Uh, I and would. then they had relationships with Lifehacker. So Whitson Gordon over at Lifehacker actually created like a secondary retweet post of their post. And through that chain, um, my little blog got 4,000 visits in a day, which was like mega viral for me back then because I was used to like 60 visits a day. So I'm like, whoa, okay, this could actually be a thing. And I go into overdrive and I'm spending like all my free time writing articles. I think I was doing like 30 articles a month on top of my internship uh, one cool thing about the internship, by the way, they actually did have a flexible like work policy. So I was able to do four 10 hour days and then get a three day weekend, which I definitely did. So I'd come into work at like six, work till five, still work at night on the blog. And then I would have all of Friday, Saturday, Sunday to work on my website. So it's like this summer where I'm seeing some success and having all of this fun building the blog and then also realizing the thing I thought I was gonna do with the rest of my life, I don't like it. And I could definitely pursue the other parts of this industry. Like there definitely are people who do lay network cable. There are people who do actually design networks and that might be more fulfilling for me, but hey, I'm having fun over here writing and building content. So let's just take this as far as I can take it. Uh, So junior year, um, I was still thinking I might have to go get a full-time job somewhere. I was sort of leaning towards maybe web development because that's a little bit more creative. But then senior year, um, I started making income on the blog. And at first it was a couple hundred bucks then 500. And then by the end of my senior year, I was making about four grand a month off of uh, various affiliate marketing. And it was outpacing what I was making on my on-campus jobs. So I was like, okay, this is actually like full-time income, at least for a kid in Iowa living with roommates. So I'm just going to see how far this goes. (laughs) Um, The other thing that sort of swayed my decision there was my uh, now fiance, I had met her during my senior year, but she was a sophomore. Uh, so she had two more years and I'm like, well, I don't want to move to some big city and try to get a job while she's still going to be down here. So I'm making enough money to stay here. I'm just going to take a risk, stay here, keep building the blog, see what happens. And I guess I'm still doing that. Yeah, I was going to say, and the rest is history. (laughs) The rest is history. I'm still building the blog, still doing all this stuff. And uh, we're getting married in like a month. Oh, congrats. That's lovely. Thank you. First words she ever said to me were, will you marry me? Uh, so I guess my answer yeah. was yes. Yes, it was. <laughs> what they were the first words. So I met my fiance at an anime club party. Okay. Because I was bored. It was like, a, I don't know, Thursday night or something. It was near Halloween. I had nothing else to do. And my roommate was the president of the anime club. So I'm like, I'm going to go crash this party. Uh, and something a lot of people don't know about me is I'm like too good, embarrassingly too good at Dance Dance Revolution, which they had set up there so i waltz in and i'm like i'm about to school all these anime nerds at ddr (laughs) so i'm doing that and i just hear from the back of the room oh my god will you marry me (laughs) and that was anna i said maybe and uh upgraded that to yes yes just a (laughs) firm yes oh that's lovely that's such a cool story um okay 
on your journey. So many questions. Uh, just, just out of interest, what were you like? It sounds like you were a very studious person before, anyways. Um, even when you said like you just read every single book on like kind of getting into college and stuff. Is that the kind of person you have always been? Because even now, obviously, you're like a lifelong learner. It, was that always mm-hmm. part of you? Or is that something you've developed since you started doing this? I think I've always been like that. Uh, I've always been an information sponge for the things that are interesting to me. Um, I'm not a traditional learner. I don't really do, I mean, I I can perform well in classes, I can take courses, but they're not the way I prefer to learn. I learn best when I have a mission in front of me and then I just go out and claw all the resources I need towards me in a very chaotic manner and end up figuring things out. Well, it works. (laughs) So, you know, I, I, I was decent in school, but I have to say I was never the kind of guy who was like always studying for classes. I was the guy who was actually in high school, like in the gymnasium or the lunchroom at 6 a.m. the day my homework was due, doing it before school started. Cause I would procrastinate on that, doing my own learning projects on the side. Uh, I probably would have been better in like an unschool or a Montessori or something like that. But yeah, when it comes to things I'm interested in, I'll just keep doing research and keep yeah. figuring out what I need to learn sense. as intensely as possible. Yeah, and, and a kind of a very similar question with the writing. Cause obviously you started writing uh, around this, but again, were you someone who always was interested in the writing aspect, or is that something that you grew to love? Uh, yeah, no, I was actually interested in writing before. Um, I never like saw myself as a writer, but even as far back as I think like seven or eight years old, I was drawing comics uh, very badly because I'm not actually good at drawing, by the way. But I was drawing comics with storylines, uh, and then my brother and I would write fiction. When I was in seventh grade, I remember I had a, a comic strip that I wrote. Um, probably for the entire year. I'm very sad that I threw those notebooks away because I had like hundreds of comics that I drew. Um, and with a friend, like I had this fi- ongoing fictional series that I'd write. It was like freaking Lord of the Rings, <laughs> but on a game show or something. I don't even remember the details, but yeah, I did a lot of fiction writing um, when I was when I was younger and I did enjoy writing when I had to do it for school as well. And then when I got to college, I wasn't necessarily blogging before College Info Geek, but I actually had like a journal that I would keep and I put that online. So writing was just something that I never like saw myself doing professionally, but just ended up enjoying as a personal pursuit. And then I ended up doing it professionally anyway. Yeah. Once you'd like taken that internship and you realize that, hey, this is not the career that I thought it was, or this is not something I want to do. And actually I prefer the writing stuff and the blogging and all and building that up. How do you keep yourself motivated to finish that degree whilst you're doing all this other extra stuff that you mm, love outside of that? I have to admit it was an image thing. <laughs> I was like, so for the internship, uh, I was there was no way I was going to quit. I'm like, I need to see this out. I need to get the experience. I think that was part of it is like, I recognized that as somebody who was writing college advice, I need to live it. Even if I don't love it, I need to live it. Uh, and I, that was what I wanted, right? Cause like you could say like, oh, why don't you shift, shift your niche to something different that you did love. But I truly did want to create the best possible resource for students to uh, get the most out of college and use it as a springboard to either get the, their dream job or, you know, go into entrepreneurship. But I wanted to build that. It's something I wanted to be able to put out into the world. And when I have a vision of a thing I want to exist in the world, I'm okay with doing things that are not super fun to get there. So the internship, I was like, this is just three months. I can endure the internship. And then with college, it was very much like, I cannot be the college blogger who dropped out of college. I at least need to earn my degree and be able to say I've had the entire four-year experience and I know what it's like. Uh, And then I can go hire people to write about the master's degree and stuff like that because there's no way I'm going into that. I don't care enough. (laughs) Done with that. But I wanted to do it. The other thing is I had a lot of flexibility. So uh, I was very fortunate that my high school had a ton of dual credit opportunities. So I actually spent a large part of my junior year and all of my senior year um, getting college credit. I actually spent half the day of my senior year of high school every day at the community college taking college classes, which were set up in a dual credit thing. So I did my accounting class. I did calculus. I did uh, probably three or four other classes in high school and came into four-year uni as a late year sophomore in terms of credits, second semester sophomore. You were very So what this meant... Yeah, I was, like I said, um, the whole 2008 thing, plus me already being like a driven person, I was like, I have to just do every single thing I can do. (laughs) Um, But what that afforded me in my later years of college was flexibility. So 
at first I was actually planning on having a major and a minor. I was minoring in speech comm, which I guess that sort of makes sense for what I'm doing now. But, uh, I dropped the speech comm minor and this is going to sound bad, but I dropped out of my university honors program. (laughs) Okay. I came into university in the honors program. I did the whole freshman honors thing. And if you graduate with honors, you get to put that on your resume and you get to walk across the stage with a golden cord around your neck. But I would have had to take extra classes and do this whole big senior honors project. And I had to do the mental calculus. Like, is it really worth having the gold cord around my neck and being able to put another line on my resume if I know I want to go whole hog on this blogging thing and I I don't want to work for anybody else in the future. I want to do my own thing. My resume is useless at that point. Like, I'm never going to use my resume again except for to show other people how to write a resume. And we have a very good article on how to write a resume because of that. But, <laughs> but yeah, I'm never going to use it again. So I dropped out of the university honors program and I spent uh, as much time as I could just building the blog. Now, the funny thing I learned, I think this was my, uh, this was my, yeah, the second semester of my junior year. So the, my first semester of junior year, I had always wanted to be an RA. I don't know if they call that an RA in the UK. It's like the person who it's like a student who lives in the dorm, but they're like the manager of all the other students. Oh, okay. Like a resident something. Is something. it like a prefect? In, in Hogwarts, it'd be the prefect it would, or, or head boy was, or whatever yeah. it is. It was my job to like keep yeah. everyone else in the dorm from burning the dorm down and to basically be their babysitter. But in exchange, I got free dorm and free yes. uh, meals and a bit of money as well. So I did that for one semester. I had always wanted to have that experience. And then I realized this is just taking up too much of my time. I also quit that. But the funny thing is, so I had a whole semester where I had minimized my credit load, was still a full-time student, but had quit all my part-time jobs and thought, I'm going to go totally full-time on College Info Geek. And I did less work on the blog during that semester than I did in any of the other ones, which taught me that constraints are very useful. And when you're working for yourself, you need to figure out how to set up those useful constraints because when you feel like you have all the time in the world, I forget whose law that is, but you know, the work expands to fill the time you've allotted for it. And I essentially gave Parkinson's law. That's right. I essentially gave uh, the work an entire semester. So (laughs) I did like, (laughs) I don't know, four articles an entire semester. I got very good at fighting games. I will say that. (laughs) But uh, yeah, I didn't get as much work done. (laughs) (laughs) So that Um, taught me like if if you're going to work for yourself, you got to have systems of some sort set up that are keeping you on uh, a schedule. That's a really good point. I think, yeah, it's such, it's so true. Like, oh, I've got all day to do this. And then it's like 10 p.m. You're like, oh, crap, I really should have done that. Um, (laughs) But I like that you had a semester and you've learned your lesson. And then you're like, okay, Mm -hmm. hang on. (laughs) <laughs> I need to do this the right way. Um, yep. That's cool. So that's the other thing, actually. Your The whole coming out of the honors program of going, weighing up the options of going, hang on, is this worth it or not? And going, actually, on reflection, this doesn't make sense. I would be doing it for, you know, a piece of paper or whatever. And given that mm-hmm. I'm going down this other road, maybe that's not the right thing. And yeah, I think that's that's really clever to, to just make that and, and not just carry on mm-hmm. with something just because you've made that decision. It's not like you're in it and that's the be all and end all. Um, so it's really cool. Yeah. Okay, so that makes sense. You've kind of freed up all that time and then you can go full hog on, on College Info Geek. Um, out of interest, you said um, towards, I think, the four years, uh, you started making money off, off the blog. Mm-hmm. But when you started, you weren't doing specific study kind of material. What was it that started changing was it bringing in the study material or uh, was it something else that that meant that you could start monetizing it and you were getting more eyes on it it actually wasn't it was so the first thing that started bringing money was uh, amazon affiliates and uh, i can't remember the order in which we did stuff but i know at some point we created like this ultimate packing list for college students so and we still have this it's just like you know the ultimate list of stuff you should bring to college Uh, from like shower supplies to tech and all that kind of stuff. So it's one page and that did pretty well. Uh, We had like a resources page with other affiliate things. And then another pretty good one was uh, we, or I guess I wrote an entire guide on how to build a personal WordPress website. So that ended up bringing in affiliate commissions, mostly on web hosting and then a little bit on WordPress themes too. So it was like almost a tech blog in terms of the money we were making. And it was really interesting because 
I established that as the income source, but then once I had written that post, I had no desire to like make more stuff on WordPress. Um, and actually when I started doing the podcast and especially the videos, I started realizing I really needed to build out a, I guess a body of work on academics because we currently have nothing on, uh, how to study for a test or how to read your textbooks, how to triage your assignments, like all this stuff students need to know. And I had no inkling of a way to make money around that. I mean, I could have made like a study course, I guess, but at the, at the time I was very, very uh, adverse to charging a lot of money for courses. I wanted everything to be free. So the cool thing is the WordPress tutorials kind of subsidized my ability to make all this free academic content and did that for quite a long time. How does your mindset change when you kind of start making the money um, and you've decided that you are now putting all your energy and this is your full-time thing? Like d d does like it suddenly go, oh, I'm like really stressing now because like, now I've, I've made that move and this is going to be paying the rent or whatever. Weirdly, I, I never had stress around it. I think it was because it was it was such a gradual thing. Um, and I, I have a lot of friends. The majority of my friends from the era where I thought of myself as a blogger are all, I would say, five to eight years older than I am. Uh, and this is very different now because you see a lot of people who are in their late teens, early 20s, making it big on YouTube and TikTok, and boom, they've got a business right now. But with blogging, it was very rare for somebody who was still college or high school age to be making uh, significant money making content. One friend, Alex uh, Mangini, he did it when he was 16 years old with a blog called Blogush. And he was actually like two years younger than me, but my inspiration. But most of them, Steve Cam from Nerd Fitness, Pat Flynn from Smart Passive Income, Jenny Blake, like all these people were a good five, six years older than me. And they had had to make this decision of, okay, I'm going to quit my full-time job and go full-time on this blog. But it was very different for me because I was a student. And by the time the blog was making four to five K a month, it was like, I think November of my senior year. So not even the second semester. So I still had a whole semester of senior year left before I ever had to like make that decision to sort of go out into the real world, quote unquote, and get a job. And so it was very much like, well, I can just keep doing this and just see how far it takes me. And if it ever fails, like I have a degree, I have a fallback plan, I can do it. And I also, you know, I've done like freelance web dev. I've done a lot of on-campus uh, jobs. I've gained technical skills. Like I truly felt that there was no risk in me going for this and it harming my job prospects. Yeah. So I just kept pushing on it. That makes a lot of sense, actually. How does that transition then to YouTube and the podcast? Was it the podcast that then came first mm -hmm. or was it the YouTube channel? Yeah, it was the podcast first. And then, so the podcast was uh, January, 2013. And then the YouTube channel wasn't until mid 2014. And everything I've ever done when it comes to content creation is a result of me getting sort of obsessed with what another creator is doing really enjoying their content and then going, Hey, I want to do that. Uh, so with podcasting, the biggest influence I had was, uh, Pat Flynn who had smartpassiveincome.com. Uh, people might now know him as a Pokemon card YouTuber as well, because yeah. he's built this very <laughs> big Pokemon card channel called Deep Pocket Monster. Uh, but back then it was all SPI and I was a rabid listener of his podcast every episode. Uh, and one thing that he would often mention on the podcast is, you know, when people come up to me at a conference, they're always mention the podcast. They never mention the blog. And they'll say like, I feel like I'm your friend because I listen to the podcast all the time. And I, I agreed with that. I'm like, I'm in the gym one day listening to him talk about this. I'm like, yeah, I do kind of feel like I know Pat, even though we've never talked because I listen to every episode of the podcast. It's like I'm hanging out with him. And that's what I love about podcasting, by the way. It's why I especially love conversational podcasts like this one, because it's almost like listeners just hanging out with us in a room. So I'm like, well, I want to do that. And uh, I, I guess I'll, I'll weave a little lesson into this. I went to a conference called Blog World 2012 because I'm ancient. And uh, this it was, it was summer 2012. I turned 21 on the plane on a red-eye flight going to this conference. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> but I was hanging out with people who were underage, so I didn't drink until like two weeks later. Uh, anyway, I go to this podcast and Pat does a whole session on how he built his podcast. And I'm like, fired up. I'm going to go home and make, make my own podcast. But I was too scared to talk into a microphone in my own room because my roommates were home and I was embarrassed. So I literally took six months to actually work up the courage to start the podcast. Um, and I finally do it January, 2013. I find Pat has this whole 
like whole posts on his website with six different videos, a whole, basically a course on how to start a podcast for free. So I follow that to the letter. I buy myself the Blue Yeti microphone, which everyone starts out with, which I think everyone shouldn't start out with, but I bought it. And uh, I got my podcast up on iTunes. And I waited for my roommates to leave to go grocery shopping or something and then just ranted into my mic for 45 minutes, published that. So that was the podcast. I had a ton of fun with it. Did a lot of interviews. Ended up um, sort of morphing into a two dudes talking show when my friend Martin joined. And we did that for eight years. And then with YouTube, it was the same thing. 2014 rolls around and uh, I'm just finding myself watching a lot of video content. And it was kind of along two different paths. So there's like the business video stuff I was watching. Um, Pat was making videos. I remember Sean McCabe, this guy I followed, who was like a hand lettering artist, kind of got into the online business sphere. He was doing a lot of video, um, especially the guys who run fizzle.co. Uh, Chase Reeves was doing a lot of video on there. And I was inspired by what they were doing. And then on the other side, I was watching like John Tron, Peanut Butter Gamer, like all these video game YouTubers who made these crazy edited video game reviews, Donkey, people like that. And I'm like, well, that looks fun. I want to do it. So I just started making videos. And the funny thing, uh, looking back on it was, I actually wasn't sure that I should put them on YouTube. I was actually debating whether I should put them on YouTube or actually pay for a hosting service called Wistia. Because I truly did not know about YouTube's algorithm at all. I was like, YouTube is a hosting service and Wistia has heat maps on their videos and you can do an email signup form on the video player and it's only like 90 bucks a month. So maybe I should use that. But so, I mean, I, I kid you not, I, I went with YouTube because I didn't want to pay Wistia's 90 bucks a month. Well, that and was uh, that was the best decision ever because, <laughs> you know, turns out YouTube has this little thing called the algorithm. But at first, I was literally just looking for a video hosting service so I could embed my videos at the top of my blog posts because oh. I wanted to make my blog posts more media rich. That and so I started making videos, started having fun with it, realized, oh, hey, editing is fun. I'm learning all these new things. And boom, now I'm a YouTuber. <laughs> <laughs> That's so freaking cool. I love how you just like kind of found your way into all of this. It's, it's, I love it. Um, okay. Going back to the blog for a second, uh, the podcast, sorry, for a second. Mm -hmm. Um you said you were scared about like your friends finding out, which I think is a common thing with people going into content creation is oh, what, are, what are my friends going to say? What are my family going to say? Um, how was that different to you having a blog and what, what they well, were thinking so of you doing that? I wasn't scared of my friends finding out. I was, uh, I was mainly like embarrassed about them hearing me while I was recording. Right. Okay. And I think like that's, that's something that's hard to get over. I sometimes still have anxiety about recording videos when my editor is in the office, even though like a million times he's acted as DP and sat there and did script supervision, but if like he's off doing his own thing and he's not part of the creation, I'm just like, uh oh, I'm going to flub a line and he's going to hear me accidentally say poop or something. <laughs> like that's hard to get over. Right. Okay. Uh, and I think that that's what makes content creation like such a good thing for introverts because like People think it's an extroverted thing, but it's not. You're just ranting at a camera for like an hour and then you get to edit it down meticulously into exactly what you want and you get to put it out asynchronously into the world and choose whether or not you respond to comments. It's like, it's very, very well tailored to introverts. <laughs> I agree. I'm like, I find it so much easier to just sit here and talk to a camera than talk to a person. <laughs> it's just like, yep. there's no one else here. This is great. Um, yeah. Okay. But yeah, I was never embarrassed about the actual content itself. Uh, and like my friends always made fun of me. I am the punching bag of jokes in my friend group Aww. and I encourage it. I actually think it's funny. So I like, I'll let it happen. Uh, but yeah, like they're always be like, Oh, there's Tom. Like he could be playing video games with this, but he's just doing business instead. And I've always leaned into the meme. I remember going to Disney world and I found a, like a fake store called business world. So that was my, pro that was my, uh, Facebook profile picture for a very long time. Just like me in front of business world. Uh, and yeah, like, so I don't care if my friends make fun of me, but I just didn't want them to hear me ranting into a microphone like a lunatic in my room. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> That's fair. Did you have any other fears uh, about doing that? Cause like, like you said, you, you wanted to be the back end guy for so long. Um, obviously it sounds like you did do some kind of comm stuff at uni, but did you have any other kind of struggles or worries about doing something like a podcast or even then YouTube? Zero fears. Nice. Uh, it, you know, I think like the more and more I went on in university, the more I realized like being the guy in the basement is not really tailored for me because I like public speaking. I like getting on a stage and talking to an audience. I like doing podcasts. Like I enjoy all of it and I have no fears about people seeing me. 
Uh, you know, I mean, I'll get like the stage jitters like everyone else, but yep. I definitely don't have that like, oh, I don't want to put my face on the internet. I've never had that. I just like dinking around on computers and I thought computer networking would give me a lot of opportunities to do that. <laughs> <laughs> and, and like, I don't know, the complexity of networks and the design of it is all very fascinating to me, um, which just like has, that was an initial, I guess, topic-based interest that taught me later. I just like to build complex things. Yes. Okay. That's fair. No, that's cool. I like, I like that you had no fear. That That's actually really surprising because I think most people I've spoken to and most people I do speak to that are, are getting into YouTube, one of their biggest fears is, is is like talking to the camera or putting themselves out there. And it's actually kind of refreshing to say, <laughs> to hear someone go, nope, I was cool with it. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna kind of get on with it and, and do it. Would you think, do you think you'd feel the same if you were starting YouTube now? As in, do you think the landscape has changed since you did it back in 2014 versus what it's like now? at all well the landscape has changed but i think only in the direction that makes it even easier and i think people should be even less worried about it you know like, there's just so many niches like back when i was getting into youtube like the idea of a channel like girlfriend reviews where a girl reviews the experience of her boyfriend playing a game like, this is so weird like where would that come from but now it's like oh yep that's that's a two million subscriber channel right there <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. like there's just okay. so much anything you're interested in there's a channel for it and it's probably huge. No, that's a, that's a pretty good point. Um, mm -hmm. Okay, so obviously you had the blog, you had the podcast and you're starting the YouTube channel. And, and obviously with the Wistia thing, the idea was to embed those into the blog. But like, mm -hmm. aside from like, what were your goals, if any, for the YouTube channel? Or like, I'm guessing it was a lot around the blog and growing the blog if you were looking at embedding. But did you set mm -hmm. anything? Did you have any like, you know, one year, two years, I, I want to do this? Or was it just like a learning process or a fun process for you? I definitely had goals. Um, they were just, I think they were modest in, in retrospect because my perception was that a YouTube channel was going to grow just like my email list. And I think like before I got into YouTube, I was maybe getting like seven email subscribers a day uh, and like doing all the hacks you're supposed to do, like write a free ebook and give that away as an email subscriber sign up bonus and things like that. So you know, I get like seven a day. So I'm like, okay, well, if I get like seven, maybe 10 subscribers a day on YouTube. Um, but I would write these out in a notebook. I had a notebook where I'd say like, here's where I am currently on YouTube subscribers, total views, Twitter followers, Facebook likes, uh, and blog traffic. And then here's where I want to be, uh, by December of this year. And then I would record where I actually ended up. And the first time I did that, I think I was at 191 YouTube subscribers. And for context, I have had my YouTube channel since 2006. My little brother and I made it like right after YouTube came out and we were just wow. posting like our really dumb ninja fight videos we'd make <laughs> in our backyard. <laughs> so I had the channel for a very long time and right. I had somehow gotten 190 subscribers from that. Uh, and I, I set the goal to hit 500 subscribers by December. So I think it was like September to December, I'm gonna be 500. And I think I ended up at like, 3000 because okay. the eighth video I made sort of kind of went viral on Reddit and brought in like a couple thousand overnight. And that was when I realized like, Oh, <laughs> that's what YouTube can do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I mean, that was virality via an external source. So I still wasn't really convinced that the YouTube algorithm was going to really pick me up. But I, I, I think at that, at that point I thought it was, Oh, I'm on camera. There's a more personal connection that I can make with the audience that I can make not quite as effectively through text or even through a podcast. So YouTube is fun and it seems to be working. Let's just go whole hog on it. Yeah. Out, out of the three, obviously you've been doing the three for since you've kind of started on this journey. Is there one medium you prefer? Uh, yeah, YouTube. Why is that? <sighs> okay. Let, I guess I have to break this down. Um, if I am being very conversational, like this right now, YouTube is my favorite because I like it to be video. I enjoy video. I enjoy building sets like you can probably see. Yes. Uh, if it's something that's actually very meticulous, I find the process of filming to be very difficult. I will flub a lot of lines um, unless I do like a straight up table read like an actor would and then sleep on it. So sometimes I actually do prefer writing just because I can just sit there and piece it together like Legos. But when I look at the things I've put out into the world, in terms of like content, it's definitely the videos that I'm most proud of because you get to essentially do a blog post in your script. 
And then you get to you get to turn it into something that's so much more. It's not just the written words. Now we get to deliver it in a really creative way and add in cinematic shots and sound design and music and tell a story, make people feel something. Like really, if you think about it, video and blogging are not so different. It's just like the written word is almost like the stepping stone to video. Yeah, uh, that leads me very nicely into my next question is what is your process like for creating a video now? So kind of from idea all the way to hitting the upload button. Yeah, so it's very different depending on the kind of video I'm making. Most of what I'm making right now is Notion tutorials. And those take the form of either uh, t- like teaching a fundamentals lesson. Uh, I think we have our databases l- lesson going live today, which is like 50 minutes long. So it's almost an hour of content. Uh, and we do like build guides and things like that. So those are never scripted out, but I do plan them out essentially like a teacher would for a class. I have like an outline of things that I need to cover and then I just cover them. And I know the product well enough that I can extemporaneously cover it just using my outline as a guide. So for that, it's pretty much, uh, write out what I need to do and cover, or if it's a build guide, I will build it first as a practice run. And then I just get here. I have my whole set set up exactly as needed to start screen recording and filming instantly. So the camera is always where it needs to be. I have a TV that I'm looking at, uh, for this podcast right now, actually, where I do my screen recordings and then like, I've got OBS ready to to rock pretty much to film it or to record the screen. Uh, and then I just send that to Tony and he edits it. So that's like for a very extemporaneous video, but for a very scripted video, say like, um, skill you're slowly losing or any of the ones that are based on a full script, they get a full script treatment. So we will go and do the research. Uh, usually we try to figure out what's the title and thumbnail before we actually start the research process. Uh, Mr. Beast does this as well. It's really just a validation step to make sure that you are creating something that's going to resonate with your audience and hopefully get picked up by the algorithm. Um, we'll do all the research we need. I'll do a script, uh, a very messy script writing process. I won't say that I, you know, it's like very straightforward, but I will just hammer away at it until I get a script and then try to take the time to edit it, to add jokes and to make it punchier and take things out. Uh, and then the way I film, I don't use a teleprompter. I've tried, I'm actually pretty decent at telepromptering, I've been told, because I've had to do it for Crash Course. Uh, but I prefer to put an iPad next to me just off camera, and then I'll memorize a line or two and say it to the camera as many times as needed. Um, fun little trick for content creators when you're going to your next line, actually start it from the last few words of your previous line. That way on the cut, you don't have this big jump in energy in the middle of a sentence that you would have if you started at the beginning of the next line. That's a great, uh, we do that. And then I'll, you know, I'll just keep it rolling until I have, I don't know, maybe half an hour to an hour of footage. Uh, and then my editor, Tony will take the card and then he'll start just cutting it down. We get what's called an A-roll cut, which is the talking head portion at the length the video will probably end up at. Um, we use a tool called frame.io to upload that. And then we it lets us basically put comments that are time stamped. So we'll use that to point out fixes, but also to add B-roll ideas at the actual time where they're supposed to go. Uh, okay, so the B-roll comes, you, you film your A-roll and then watch it back and then decide where the B-roll needs to go. For the most part, yeah. yeah. I mean, sometimes okay. during script writing, I'll be like, oh, right here, we should have a shot of this or this this great song I have in mind. Let's, so I'll put those as comments in Notion. But yeah. like the majority of B-roll, actually, we think, about, we think of it after we've locked the A-roll cut. Nice. And uh, so I actually have a Notion template where I can export a comma-separated value or CSV file from frame.io to get all those timestamps and comments nice. and then bring them into Notion into a table. And what that lets me do is sort them either by the timestamp when it's time to edit, so Tony can go chronologically down the timeline, but also I can tag them based on the action it requires to gather them. So I tag them with either film or overhead camera or um, online image that we need to get from somewhere or like Photoshop, uh, screen recording, like whatever I need to do. And then if it's a very complex video, I also sub tag it with location for filming. So it might be like backyard or office or studio, wherever it is, kitchen. So that way I can actually create a multi-layered sort and I can batch the tasks of gathering all those things. I can be like, all right, I'm gonna take half an hour to do all the screen recordings now. I'm gonna go to the office and film, everything needs to be filmed there. And that makes it a lot faster to actually gather all that B-roll. And then from there, Tony can just ingest it, switch over to the chrono view and actually edit the video. That's very cool. How long does this process take? So like how long do you usually spend on your script writing and then 
maybe the filming and then kind of the whole B-roll filming? Uh, it's super dependent on the video. Right. Um, so I have written scripts in 10 minutes and I have taken like weeks to write a script. It depends on what it is. I, I mean, I, st I literally have a script that's still in development from like February, which... Uh, this is this is like a funny thing about Ali. Like Ali always beats me to video topics that I was working on first because he's just faster at script writing. Um, like I was doing uh, ways to make an extra thousand bucks a month, and I think I had started the script writing process for that like in January or February. But I was like, I want this one to be insane. So I did actual interviews for every one of my list items with somebody who's doing it, and I'm like weaving those in. Uh, me and my like Ollie's had his video out on that for like three months now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he'll just and I still and haven't gotten that done. <laughs> no. Yeah, so I like I need to turn that into that's going to be like an hour long video at this point. Yeah. Um. Yeah, and I feel like I've gotten to a point where one of the roadblocks I was feeling with content creation uh, recently has sort of gone away, where my channel was very dependent on sponsorship revenue. So I was like feeling like my videos needed to be short in order to like not have the conversion rate go too far down. But uh, now that I'm selling my Notion templates, I can sort of basically put out the content that I want because I don't rely on sponsors quite as much. So I think I'm just gonna keep making that video be an hour long or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> just put it out. <laughs> you're like, here you go. Look, it's time stamped. Check it out, whatever you're interested in. But yeah, it's an hour long and I don't apologize for that. Yeah, no, neither should you. <laughs> that's really cool. Actually, that's that's a good point. At what point did you start to think about the fact that you were maybe over reliant on sponsorships or just the fact that you wanted to kind of have more streams of income coming in? What was the thought process behind that and how did that kind of play out? Yeah, that's that's a, a complex question for me. Um, and it, it's it kind of goes back further than sponsorships because I've never been fully reliant on sponsorship income. I've always had affiliate marketing on the blog. Um, I've made a, a decent amount every month from my own book sales on Amazon for quite a few years. And then there were the odd like contract things we pick up. So there's always been multiple forms of income, multiple affiliate deals going on. But when sponsorships entered the picture, especially when I got linked up with Standard, every video was able to have a sponsor. And I mean, I think like working with Standard probably doubled my income overnight. Wow. So it got to the point where I'm like, whoa, okay, this is huge. And for a while it was amazing, you know, right? Like all I gotta do is make a video and then I can put a sponsor at the end. And it's always the same, like four sponsors. So we don't have to go out finding new ones. It was kind of a dream scenario. Yeah. But I think, you know, I did it for five years and a lot of people, I don't think anybody wants to do the same thing for five years. And, you know, I got to the point where I was just like, I was making videos on a schedule or off a schedule or whatever, but there's was like, there's always a sponsor. I just make the video. And it sort of got to feeling like a treadmill because I felt like there wasn't a huge overall mission for my channel at that point. Like I'm making videos on productivity and organization, but it's very broad. Every video is a useful thing, but it's not contributing to this bigger overall, I guess, thing I'm trying to build. And then I got into Notion professionally just because we needed wiki software. And then I sort of realized that I can manage my video making process with this, holy crap. And it can function as a great library for my videos after, which uh, most project management software can't do. And then I started realizing like, oh wait, people actually want templates I'm making. So let's just try this out. And now I like have that mission again. It's like, oh, I, I understand where I'm going to in a big direction because the world of PKM, personal knowledge management, is very different now that we have tools that allow us to build bespoke workflows that fit what we need to do in our own work. And I don't even think we're close to the potential of that yet. So with my second channel, Thomas Frank Explains, it's not like every video is just like, here's a package of a video that's on its own. It's like, this is contributing to either a course or helping you build something useful. And ultimately, like anybody can use this as an all-in-one resource to build whatever tools they need to manage anything in their lives. And that's very interesting to me. Uh, and very fortunately, the paid templates we've launched are doing well. So that means we can you know, put out stuff over on that channel and that can be a big income source. And I can do maybe longer videos on Thomas Frank or videos that are not as tailored towards you know, converting well for a sponsor or whatever it may be. Yeah, actually I was just thinking, cause you have been doing it for such a long time, like in like, 
not the real world, but like in an office job, for example, or the corporate world, you kind of do something and then people move around, either move companies or move jobs every so often. Whereas in the YouTube world, I guess if people have been doing it since YouTube or whatever, you know, 2012, 2013, 2014, it's starting to mm -hmm. come to that point where you would maybe in, in a professional environment start thinking about switching things up. And I'm just wondering yeah. like how that, how you do that in the world of YouTube and how you feel about your content when you get to that point. And I think there's definitely a lot of ways you can go with that. So like the most obvious one is just switching the content you're making up. Um, PewDiePie was making Let's Plays for years. And now when you look at his channel, it's like, it's a grab bag of stuff. He talks about drama half the time. So that's one way you could do it. Um, another way is you could sort of move into a role where you're still YouTube adjacent. Uh, and I think uh, my friend Chris Sharp, who he is like the guy behind the camera for Yoga with Adrian, he's a good example of that. Like he is still helping to produce this huge YouTube channel, but he's not the person on camera. So like there's a lot of people, uh, you know, Ben Stiller is sort of like the classic example in Hollywood. He was starring in all these films back in the early 2000s. Now he's directing and doing a ton of work there and you never see him on camera anymore. So I think like YouTube gives you a spring off, like a spring point where you can go into many different directions. Um, in my case, like we're still doing YouTube, but I realize like there's also this other business that we can build that isn't just me sitting here and making videos all day long. And I think that fits me perfectly because I, I don't want to do the same thing for 10 years. Even if there's all these new camera techniques I can learn, like I have to follow my interest. And at a certain point I realized like, well, I don't want to learn yet another camera technique. I actually am more interested in figuring out like, how do I figure out an e-commerce workflow? How do I build a sales page? How do I build a team where the people who are working for me have uh, empowerment and there's like a lot of automation and, and uh, decision-making they can do? Like those are interesting problems for me to solve. Yeah. But to solve them and to learn the skills required, I can't be spending all my time making YouTube videos. Speaking of team though, um, how has your kind of team built over the years and and kind of what was your first high? I, I, it might have even been way back when with, with college and figure eight, but how do you mm -hmm. know when to make the hires and, and do you have any maybe regrets along the way? I, I think every entrepreneur is going to tell you that uh, their biggest regret is not hiring sooner. Uh, and I think I'm I'll right along with most of them in telling you that the sign I was given to hire was I'm overwhelmed and I can't handle this and I'm super stressed. <laughs> Got it. Uh, and the biggest one for YouTubers, and I, you know, I think YouTubers are probably listening to this more than any other group, is um, get an editor. Every YouTuber thinks there's some special magic secret sauce to my editing and that's why my channel is successful. And if I outsource the editing, it's going to burn and fail and my life will be over. And that's not true. Uh, the editing, like you may have an amazing style of editing. Uh, I highly doubt that anybody listening to this will have an editing style, like anything like say polyphonic or Volksgeist. They're the only people I could think of where it's like, okay, I could see how it'd be pretty hard to emulate your editing style. I thought mine was unique because I'm so smart for putting easing curves on my After Effects transitions. Like, that's not hard. My editor, Tony, learned how to do that. So yeah, I was spending hours and hours and hours editing videos and uh, especially like working with sponsors. I have no editor. I'm just doing all-nighters sometimes trying to meet my deadlines and my fiance is like, you need to hire somebody. You need to stop doing this. Why do you keep doing this to yourself? So I finally hired an editor and it was challenging. Um, you know, hiring at like Tony's a very good editor, but it was challenging because I'm opinionated and I'm like, I want things to look a specific way that exists in my head, but I can't communicate it very well <laughs> or I need things to feel a certain way. There's a lot of feeling in editing, I think. So, you know, there was a process of communicating, giving feedback, going back and forth, but over time, he got closer and closer and closer to autonomously editing where I had to basically give no feedback and brought in his own creativity and things I wouldn't have thought of. So it's been very rewarding having an editor. Um, you asked about the history. So editor was not the first thing I hired for. I actually first hired um, my best friend Martin to redesign my website, College Info Geek, and turn it into a responsive blog. So I don't even know if people understand the term responsive anymore because it's like, People just, that's just what the internet is. But if you were like me and on the internet a lot in like 2000, the early 2000s, or even like the first half of the 2010s, a lot of websites were what you call static, meaning they always look the same on any device. 
So like you have to pinch and zoom and you, you sometimes go on an old website yourself to do that. But most websites today, their, their uh, UI scales down based on the width of the device. That's called responsive web design. Well, back in 2012, 2013, when I wanted to do this, most blogs were not responsive. Most websites were still static, but everyone was starting to use the web on their phones and everyone was starting to realize like, okay, we need to start making a responsive website to do that you have to learn uh, responsive design, which at least involves writing uh, media queries in your CSS, where it's like, if the if the window is this small, then do this with the CSS. If it's this big, then do this. And I was like, I could take the time to learn how to do this. But if I do, I will probably take three months off of publishing anything. And uh, at the time, my friend Martin was working this on-campus job. I think they were paying him $8.25 an hour and it was like a web development job, but he didn't like it. And he was better at web development than me. So I was like, trade proposition, Martin, you quit your job and I will pay you the exact dollar amount that you would have earned there for the rest of the school year. If you quit your job and work on this redesign, even if you get it done in like two weeks, I'll pay you the exact amount of money you would have made quitting that job or to, to basically keep on the job. And I think it was like 2,600 bucks. We were still college students, so this seemed like a big amount of money to it's us. a lot of money, yep. <laughs> so he does it. He does an amazing job. Um, I designed it in Photoshop, which, boy, y'all are spoiled these days with Adobe <laughs> XD and Figma and Sketch or whatever they call the thing on the Mac. Like Building a website in Photoshop is a pain because if you want to change a UI element in one place, you have to go change it in every other place manually. And like Figma just like lets you do these do reusable components. It's so cool. Anyway, so I like designed the entire website in Photoshop meticulously. And then he takes it and just implements my vision perfectly. And like, I have to give a little bit of uh, brag time to Martin. Back in 2013, 14, when we launched this, uh, all the big bloggers who had like millions of dollars or whatever, they put out their responsive designs and they were just super buggy all these different problems, their, their email pop-ups wouldn't be responsive and it would like break my phone's browser. Uh, Martin did like a perfect flawless job. We had, I think one of the best responsive implementations of a website back then that, that I saw at least it was excellent. And today it's like the norm, but, uh, he did such a good job. He was so far ahead of the curve that I was like, I have to pay you double. Like I'm going to, I'm going to double what I paid you. Cause geez, so that was the first experience I had with delegation. It worked really, really well. And Martin still works with me to this day. Um, he, he has done so many things. He's co-hosted my podcast with me for years. He's acted as COO. He has um, done like editing and video consultation. He edited our podcast. Uh, he does basically anything and everything that is needed. But his real strength lies in digging into super technical problems. So... Uh, most recently he helped us implement uh, like a true recurring tasks solution in notion. And then he's been doing like these really great updates to my current website as well. We love Martin. <laughs> yeah. Martin is great. Uh, so there's Martin, uh, ransom is the business development head and head of content at college info geek. In fact, he basically has full autonomy over college info geek these days. So he started off as a commenter on the blog. Oh. <laughs> and then like he was commenting every post. And then uh, at one point, I think he asked a guest post. And I was like, yeah, I remember seeing you in the comments. Why don't you guest post? And he wrote some great guest posts. And then he slowly moved to being a paid staff writer. And then now he's just like in charge of the site, essentially. That's brilliant. <laughs> um, I love that. <laughs> yeah. So we've got Martin. We've got, uh, we've got Ransom. We have Tony, my editor. And then uh, Amanda is my assistant. And uh, who else do we have? Oh, and we just hired this guy, Alex, who is doing support for our Notion templates and absolutely crushing it in our support community. So that small team, but yeah. get a lot done. Killing it. Oh, that's awesome. Um, I realize I've kind of slightly gone over time. Uh, can I steal one more question or do you have to? Absolutely, run? yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah, I don't, I don't uh, have a hard stop right now, so. Okay, amazing. Um, so I remember you saying when you were doing the podcast that you, you used to have like three angles, didn't you? One on you, one on Martin, and then like a kind of split screen thing. And yes. I remember at, at one point, I, I can't remember what the reason was, but for some reason like, you didn't have it and you kind of just put it out with a static split screen or something. And you realized that nobody like cared and it didn't make any difference and you saved all this time. Have you found anything like that in kind of your YouTube world or anything else that you've gone, 
oh, that actually didn't make any difference. Why were we putting so much energy into this? I, I wish I would have kept a journal of all these. Oh. There are many of them. There are many of them. Um, another one is editing every breath and vocal pause out of the podcast. Like if you go back and you listen to the first probably 100, 110 episodes of the CIG podcast, they're tightly edited. You're never going to hear a breath. You're never going to hear a cough. And I would spend hours just cutting every little bit of vocal silence out of there. Uh, and then I started realizing like as long as you and whoever you're talking to, if it's a guest or coast or whatever, have a good flow, you don't need it. I mean, like, does Joe Rogan edit? Nope. Does the H3 podcast edit? Nope. I'm trying to think like the biggest podcasts out there. Yep. They don't because they get guests who are good on camera or at least they're good on the mic and they can have a good conversation. Now, I, I had a couple of interviews post that period where the person was very, very nervous. Uh, they had to restate things sometimes. Like we had to go do edits for those. But when it was me and Martin, well, we're both very used to it. So when we sort of like solidified our show format to be just us, we realized we do not need to edit because we're both experienced. If there's dead air, I can jump in with something like we know what we're doing. And I honestly think it actually enhances that feeling of hanging out and being in the room with the two creators if you aren't making the super tightly edited thing. So that was one of them. Um, another one that I definitely thought of, if you go back and you watch my YouTube content from say 2015, 2016, you'll see like these title cards come up all the time. And like I spent lots of time drawing easing curves and after effects to get like the perfect amount of animation deceleration on those. And like I took pride in that, but then I started to think, oh, well that's part of my channel's secret sauce. Or I'm using this particular plugin that does like a motion blurred swish pan when I do transitions. That's part of my channel's secret sauce. And if I don't do that, I'm gonna get less views. I don't know, you know? I mean, Ollie's put yeah. out videos where he never cuts and it's just him talking and it gets like a million views. Um, I remember like back in the day, grade A under A, he was just like Microsoft paint drawings. It was like the worst production value I could think of. And like he was getting millions of views. So what that taught me, and like maybe this is the biggest lesson that you can take away as a content creator is the audience comes for the connection that they have with you and for the way you make them feel they don't care about production quality to the same level that you do. Now, depending on what you're creating, production value can matter, but ultimately a lot of people I think use production value and editing tricks as a crutch for not investing in storytelling or not investing in developing charisma and on-camera pres uh, presence or not investing in figuring out the exact right topics to talk about. Um, a good example right now, uh, and you know, this isn't to like throw any of these creators under the bus, but like the biggest person in the watch space right now is Nico Leonard, who does not do any fancy editing, but he's the most entertaining person. He's hilarious. He's like, he's literally a comedian basically just talking about watches. And then you look at somebody who um, is a, you know, a little bit of le like a lesser channel size. They invest a lot of time in these like beautiful B-roll shots of these watches that are like with macro lenses and they have them on spinning tables and stuff. And that's cool. But you can see where the audience is going. So I think, you know, a, a large reason that the other creators do these crazy back row shots is because they are fascinated by that. They want to do it for themselves. But anybody who's watching that going, oh, if I don't have crazy B-roll, I'm not going to get an audience. Look to Nico and you'll realize it's not the B-roll that gets you the audience. It's the connection you make with the audience. It's the way you make them feel. It's can you tell a story or put together a bunch of topics in an entertaining way that keeps them watching. That's a lovely way to end this. <laughs> I, I love that message. <laughs> I, for one, have spent so long like messing around with B-roll and being like, oh, it needs to be this, it needs to be this, it needs to be this. But you're right. If you could spend that time on the story or the content, that's going to take you so much further than the fancy B-roll. Um, mm-hmm. What a great point. Yeah, the only fanciness you should really invest, I mean, you know, do what you want. Do what makes you fulfilled. But where a lot of your fanciness should go is to your thumbnail. Yes. And this, this seems Good like point. such an afterthought. I'm guilty of it. I'll be like, what's the perfect shade of green that I should put in this color grading on this one shot that's like eight minutes into the video? <laughs> and then I'm like, oh, I got to make a thumbnail before I throw it up. Let me just throw something together. <laughs> Like, no, it should be the opposite. Like you should spend like two, three, four hours, make like 15 different thumbnails, test them all out, 
have your friends look at them, uh, you know, build a feedback Slack channel or discord channel with other YouTubers. Like that's where you should be investing because title thumbnail, that's what draws people in. And then you can convince them to keep watching. Yeah. As you go back to, you said earlier that that's the first thing you do in your process, right? Title and thumbnail nine times out of 10. Title and thumbnail. Yep. Is the one gold standard right there. (laughs) Love it. Uh, Thomas, thank you so, so much for doing this. I really, really appreciate your time and for staying over. (laughs) This was really, really interesting. And I have a bunch of questions, but like (laughs) this was, this was great. It was so interesting to hear about your early story as well. So thank you so much. Yeah, this was a ton of fun. So thanks for having me on the show.